Good evening. You probably recognize me by my yellow pickup in the parking lot. I'm Pastor Dietz, and I'm the one who is from Green Bay, who serves the Northern Wisconsin District of our Synod through our Synod's Ministry of Christian Giving. And it is my privilege to again conduct worship services here at St. John St. James over this 4th of July weekend. That's really the thought that is uppermost in our hearts and minds this weekend. It is how the Lord has blessed us as a nation with the freedoms that we enjoy. Those freedoms are wonderful because they allow us to gather together here in God's house to worship without any kind of government intervention. That's not the case in many places throughout the world. So sometimes, unfortunately, we take the freedoms that we have in our country for granted. And a weekend like this reminds us that our freedoms are truly important. They're freedoms that men and women have fought for and died for so that we can have that type of freedom. But the freedom that we enjoy as a country pales in comparison with the freedom that we have from the consequences of our sins. That's because there was one who fought and died for us on Calvary's cross, namely our Savior Jesus. He is the one who has brought us true freedom, freedom from the threat of punishment in hell, freedom from the powers of Satan, true Christian freedom. Let's begin our worship with the singing of the opening hymn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. 
For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. We pray. Lord, keep this nation under your care. Bless the leaders of our land that we may be people at peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations of the earth. Help us elect trustworthy leaders, contribute to wise decisions for the general welfare, and serve you faithfully in our generation to the honor of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament scripture reading is recorded in the sixth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy and begins at verse 4 through 7 and continues at verse 13. The importance of keeping God's commands is part of our true obedience to the Lord as he has commanded us in the fourth commandment not only to honor our parents but also all those in authority. We're reminded of this in the words before us this evening. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. This is the word of our Lord. Our epistle reading is recorded in the 13th chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans and begins with the first verse. This portion of God's word, we hear how the Lord is the one who has put into place government and the importance of our being good citizens by following the words and the laws of our land. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. 
The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remaining remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. Forever, whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. This is the word of our Lord. Please stand. We confess our Christian faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing out of respect for the words and works of Jesus, recorded for us in Matthew chapter 7, Mark chapter 17. A portion of our gospel reading this evening will serve as the basis for the sermon. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated for the singing of our next hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours through the knowledge of God the Father and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for your spiritual growth on this 4th of July weekend is the words of Jesus from chapter 12 of Mark's Gospel, verse 17. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. These are Jesus' words. Don't taxes always seem to be a bother? Have you ever heard of something called a poll tax? No, it's not the government's way of getting you to pay taxes on the number of light poles, electricity poles, or telephone poles on your property. A poll tax is the kind referred to in St. Mark's Gospel. All took place between what, something that happened with Jesus and some Jewish leaders. In those days, a tax was actually called a census. It was levied on every adult to provide funds for Caesar's coffers. It served to remind every adult Jew that they lived under heathen rule. We're told here in Mark's Gospel that some Herodians and some Pharisees came to Jesus one day to pose a question of paying the poll tax. They said to Jesus, is it lawful to pay a tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay it or not? They were sure that they could put Jesus in a no-win situation. No matter how he answered, they thought that he would lose. Either he would lose many of his followers, or he could be accused of subversion against the powers that be. But Jesus saw through their scheme. He didn't answer their question with a yes or a no. Instead, he asked to have a look at the coin that would be used to pay the tax. And there it was, on that coin, Caesar's image and the proper inscription. And to make his point, Jesus asked his inquirers whose image it was. And they had to admit right away that it was Caesar's. The very fact that they had a denarius ready implied that they were used to living under Roman rule. However, Jesus moved beyond the point of springing their trap. He seized the occasion to set forth a principle that is very dear to all Bible-believing Christians. We speak of it as the doctrine of two kingdoms. As citizens of our country, we live in two sets of relationships with God. On the one hand, like all human beings, we are God's people and live under the authority of our government. However, we are also God's children by baptism. And that's exactly where we differ from unbelievers. We assemble to worship God to make use of God's word and sacraments. And then we move out from our gathering here to serve our fellow human beings as Christians, not just as citizens. And Jesus actually refers to these two relationships in the words before us. He says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. This evening... On the 4th of July weekend, we direct our attention to God and or Caesar. We'll focus on duality, diversity, and duty. We know 
Our God is one. Yet, God works with us in two ways. On both fronts, the enemy, the same enemy, opposes Jesus, and that enemy once moved some Herodians and Pharisees to try to put Jesus to the test. You see, that's how Satan works. He schemes to destroy or distract what God wills for our good. He and his fellow demons are determined to upset civic order, which is one of God's blessings. And the demonic forces that lie beneath the surface of any civil disobedience are anxious to upset and destroy all that God has established to keep us from living what we would call living by the law of the jungle. Satan wants to undermine and overcome God's ordained powers of government. At the same time, he is even more determined to lead you and me into sin and unbelief. In that way, he accomplishes or hopes to accomplish this, that he will cut us off from that other set of relationships we have as God's children. And if he accomplishes that, we become under his thumb, his power. I'm not sure if you've heard this or not, but there are some people from other Christian denominations who refer to us Lutherans as schizophrenic. Yeah schizophrenic when we focus on these two sets of relationships they say that splits up life into two compartments ah but all those people who accuse us of being schizophrenic really ought to take a look at people in our day we may meet someone who is both a nurse and a mother we may encounter another person who is a police officer and a father. Both of these work in two sets of relationships. They're not schizophrenic. In fact, the two sets of relationships are improved by the fact that they are lived out by the same person. Therefore, Jesus speaks of our relationship to God and to Caesar for the purpose of distinguishing between them in our everyday life. But what about that diversity in our relationship to God as His people, as His children? As children of God, we're members of His church. And one of the instruments, one of the main instruments of His church is God's Word. It shows us our sins and our Savior. It speaks of God's anger against sin. It speaks of His love, His mercy, His grace in Christ. Caesar, or the government, operates completely differently. The state deals in matters of justice, political freedom, economics, and the general welfare of citizenry. Now that requires legislation, with the authority to make sure that laws are enforced and lawbreakers are brought to justice. And the symbol of the government is the sword. In fact, if people weren't sinful by nature, there would be no need for Caesar, no need for government. But since they are, people must be constrained and guided in their civic relationships, their civic responsibilities, guided and constrained by all kinds of laws and ordinances. Someone once said this, and I quote, governments exist because people are so evil. End of quote. In addition, Caesar raises and commands military forces. The state uses the police department to preserve order. It extracts money for this in the form of taxes. In our society, 
the government has the role of balancing off the selfishness of one group against another in order to preserve a measure of liberty. The government operates with the threats and punishments of the law. And our relationship with God as Christians is different. Our relationship with God involves something very near and dear to us. Worship. Many Christians have had trouble with this in the past. For example, when Christians many centuries ago were ordered to burn incense to the statue of Caesar, those Christians rightly objected. Jesus says that we are to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but only what is properly Caesar's. And worship is not one of them. Now, when the government tells us to do something which is contrary to God's revealed will and word, then we must obey God rather than man, according to Acts chapter 5. So when we fulfill our duties as voting, paying taxes, serving on juries, obeying all the laws and all that, we realize that these are responsibilities that we owe Caesar. Governments serve as God's instruments for justice, freedom, and good order. In our epistle reading, we heard Paul refer to government as God's servant for your benefit. So yes, there is a difference between God and Caesar, both in how they operate and in how we serve them. Governments belong to the arrangements God has established for this life. But they are temporary. There was no need for the sword for the government before Adam and Eve fell into sin. There will be no governments in heaven. Their scope is limited to life here on this earth. Some years ago, the President of our United States offered amnesty to those who had fled our country during the Vietnam conflict. That forgiveness was only good for this life in the case of those who accepted his offer. On the other hand, when your pastor speaks the words of absolution in the worship service, he is proclaiming the forgiveness of sins that extends all the way into eternity. He's using the instruments God has established for building and maintaining his church. Now Jesus makes it very clear here that the twofold relationship in which we live is not an optional matter. He commands, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. We may not and Never, never dismiss either the church or the state as useless and unnecessary. Both of these institutions stand in service to God, even though they differ greatly in their mode of operation, motivation, content, and authority. In God's kingdom, we live in response to His grace of saving us from the horrible consequences of our sins. Our motivation to do that is love for God who loved us first. And so we cherish God's word and sacraments as his special means of blessing us. And as citizens of the United States of America, we engage in certain activities that belong to responsible citizenship because they're ways in which we keep the fourth commandment. And so, as we observe this 4th of July holiday weekend, we do so with special thanks to God that he has made us first and foremost citizens of heaven and then also citizens of a free country where we are free to worship and serve him without fear of government threat or opposition or persecution. 
It is our prayer today, this weekend, and always that God will continue to bless us with his grace so that we remain his faithful children and that we may become better citizens of our freedom-filled country. And so by God's grace and power, we will give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and lives through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Almighty God, we acknowledge with thanks that all we have and enjoy is a gift from your gracious hand. We come before you today in heartfelt appreciation for our nation and its people. You have enriched us with the bounties of farm and factory, the beauty of forest and mountain, and the marvels of medicine and science. Look with favor upon our nation and preserve our cherished liberties. Enable our leaders to govern with wisdom, honesty, courage, and justice. Protect those who serve in the armed forces and those who maintain peace and safety in our communities. Keep our financial institutions secure and our economy strong. Bless our fields that they may produce abundant harvests. Guard us from calamities of nature and accident and spare our land from the ravages of disease and epidemic. Strengthen the homes of our nation. By your spirit, lead husbands and wives to love each other parents to nurture their children, young adults to assume responsibility, and children to show respect. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. To you, O Lord, we bring our thanks and our requests. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kind is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please remain standing for our closing hymn. Thank you.
You may be seated. The announcements for today and next week are in your bulletins. A special reminder that there will be a divine call meeting next Sunday at 10 o'clock following the hopefully outdoor worship service. And so you're encouraged to be a part of that next Sunday, July 11th, after the hopefully outdoor worship service. And hopefully we'll have an outdoor worship service this Sunday, uh, depending upon how the weather is and all of that. Um, also, I've been asked to uh, make mention that the uh, flowers here are from the funeral of Roger Yonke, who is the husband of Jenny. The other announcements are in your bulletins. You do not have to, uh, there will not be a test on all the different announcements that are in there, uh, quite extensive. So please uh, take, uh, take the opportunity to read, uh, read those announcements and especially those that pertain specifically to you. I believe that takes care of the announcements for this evening, unless there's something else that I, uh, somebody mentioned to me and uh, the two brain cells didn't connect. Uh, but uh, if not, that's great, fantastic. Have a wonderfully safe, Fourth of July weekend, and please remember the freedoms that we enjoy as Christians and as citizens of our wonderful country. God's blessings. Thank you.